in uh, Cafe Zola's place. <laughs> I'm having a, uh, as you can see, it says on the cup, coffee. Espresso, coffee. Espresso, yes. espresso. Uh-huh, and coffee. And on this side, it says coffee. Let uh -huh. me stir it up a little bit. Uh -huh. oh. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my. It has uh, grapes in it. <laughs> well, that's an interesting thing to put in coffee. Mm, mm. It makes one wonder what kind of coffee you're having. Well, let's see what else it has in here. Mm, more grapes. <laughs> well, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yes, yes, okay. <laughs> uh, yesterday, <clears throat> I made a brief explanation as to why some of the language in the ghetto sketches, mm -hmm. the book I'm reading from, ghetto sketches. I made an effort to explain why it was mm -hmm. that some of the language might be considered profane, mm -hmm. maybe even vulgar. But I felt in order to be true to the characters and the character of the work that I had to use the language that came from the citizens involved. So that explains that. Uh, since the novel came out in 1972, I've had numerous occasions to explain to many uh, groups of people that there were times when people actually spoke like this and Terms like nigger and motherfucker was just ordinary terms of expression. Some might say affection. They could also be pejorative depending on the circumstances, depending on the tone of the conversation or the, the level of the heat and the argument. But, uh, well, so it was. I'm saying all this to say that <laughs> I'm not particularly in love with the N-word or the M-word. But if my characters wake me up in the middle of the night and say, hey, tell it like it is, or tell it like it was, then I feel obligated to do that. And here we go. I'm on the third uh, chapter in this book. Oh, man, it's a great espresso. <laughs> With grapes, yeah. Good. It has the hint of strawberries mm. and a little bit of, uh, anyway. The fire, uh, the fire never goes out on the stem in the hood. The grimy little faces and slogan t-shirts, children of the dust, carry a self-flaring spark a torch that has always been lit again and again by men who remember. Men who remember people, places, and things that they've never actually known. But mean, but remain no less real because they are passed on to the young. The men who remember seat themselves on high places up and down the stem, spin around on effervescent bar stools, perch on the edges of many park benches, or simply sit tall and proud on milk crates in the center of muggy tribal nights, whispering dangerous stories in hoarse, wine-soaked voices about who shot John, or telling in their own ways what yesteryear has to do with today. The little black faces pressed against the opaque white windows surrounding them listen. They don't really care what the others say. All they want is a little bread of one variety or another, some kind of love, and a few dreamy fairy tales that they can relate to. <laughs> mm. 
Sherman, Willie Burks, Bobo, Billy Woods, and Chico Daddy, junior members of the Afro Lords, lounge around on the front steps of Miss Rabbit's tenement apartment building, puffing on cigarettes, surreptitiously passing a bottle of cheap wine around as they deal with the passing scene and try to forget that tomorrow is Monday, meaning school. Mayfowler strolls by, his head held high, the muscles in his slender face twitching as he tries to ignore the lodge. What you up to, Mr. Lady? Mayfowler stops instantly, turns, hands on hips to her question. I'm minding my own business, Billy Woods, Junior, and leaving yours alone. The gang members enjoying any kind of scene try to agitate your drama. Tell him about it, Mr. Sweet Thang. Mayflower flashes angry eyes at Billy Woods, gives the whole group a careful, well-cultivated look of disdain, and prances off like a bruised mare, knees high, past the great Lord Buddha and his woman Josie, hassling as he strolled up the street. Josie, her words slurred slightly, talks loudly into Buddha's ear. Now listen, Buddha, if I told you once, I've told you a hundred times, I'm not going to keep on going to all these changes with you. Mayfowler nods pleasantly at the couple, a slight smile of amusement dimpling his jaws. Hi, Buddha. Hi, Josie. Buddha turns on Josie, jerking her mouth off in his ear with a grim look. Oh, hey, May, what it is. Josie taking a quick shot at Mayflower. Hello, Mayflower. Turns back to her number with Buddha. All right, now you just tell me. Just tell me what makes you think you too good to work. Just tell me, because I sure as hell wants to know. Mm Hershey -hmm. neck. Yes, it does. <laughs> Do it the, right. great, <laughs> the great Lord Buddha, a deep cleft series of frowns wrinkling his brow on top of the grim expression covering the rest of his face, speaks to Josie from between clenched teeth. Josie, God damn it, I am working. I'm doing my thing. Why should I waste my time on some jive ass job when it prevents me from doing my very own thing, huh? Answer that if you can. Bullshit, you just lazy, that's all. You don't want to work. The great Lord Buddha, beneath Mao Mask's face, touches delicately at his polka dot oil on Ascot, pulls his ivory bone hold out of his breast pocket, gently screws a Russian cigarette into the end of it, and stands back from Josie, better known behind their backs as Miss Heatwave. <laughs> Josie, look, you come on upstairs. We'll talk about all this later on. Josie, her hands on her hips, pouting her bottom lip out aggressively, stands looking at Buddha as though he were a turd. Why can't we talk about it now? Buddha leans in close to Josie, blows a stream of smoke slowly into her face. Cause now ain't the time. I said we'll talk about it later. Now why don't you go upstairs and cool off? I'll be up in a little while. Josie squishes her eyes up hatefully at Buddha, stifles the urge to say something nasty and turns with every eye on every lush curve to click clap up the stairs. She wears high heels. The great Lord Buddha, shaking his head from side to side in a disgusted fashion, looks from one young face to another. Women, can't do with them, can't do without them. Mm -hmm. What was it, what was it Nietzsche once said? When you go to women, carry the whip. <laughs> what are you young, uh, young bloods doing out here this late? Planning some kind of offbeat crime or something? Bobo, giggling foolishly at the attention being paid to them by one of their favorite people, answers for the group. <laughs> uh, you know, 
<laughs> no, nothing like that. We're just cooling it. Drink a little ripple, that's all. You want to taste? Buddha nods no in a reserved sort of way, wrinkling his mouth up at the sight of the pre-offered bottle. Uh, not for me, sport. I can dig it for you, but it would mess my stomach up for days. What kind of wine is that anyway? Ripolino. <laughs> Ripolino. Mm -mm -mm. The great Lord Buddha, his mouth unwrinkled into a slight smile, stands authoritatively and announces to the group, That isn't wine, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Chateau de Kim is a wine. Pomard 39 is a wine. That shit you ought to drink is just a bunch of chemicals that people stirred around in a vat and shot some carbonation into. Why don't you cats put your coins together and get some good wine? Therefore, lawyers look blackly into each other's faces and then, as a chorus, react. What coins? <laughs> <laughs> Shit, we had to struggle to get this. For real. Okay. Buddha, the slight smile widening a bit, looks down benevolently on the group. <laughs> you little poor ass motherfuckers. Here, here. He pulls a five dollar bill from his watch pocket and holds it out to the group. Who's gonna be the runner? All eyes point to Sherman, who reaches out proudly from the steps and skips away like a gazelle. Buddha watching him pull away. Hey, he looked kind of kind of young. Well, they, they sell it. One of the winos will cop for him for 50 cents. The great Lord Buddha slowly settles grandly on the steps, sighing a little as his bottom touches the chill of the stone, makes an elaborate ritual out of tapping the roach of one Russian cigarette out of his ivory bone holder to replace it with another, has it lit immediately by a member of his attentive audience and takes a few long leisurely drag. Any of you cats ever been to China? Chico dad, his head cocked to one side like the Victrola dog asked a one word question. China? <laughs> Billy Woods moving down a couple of steps to be near. Where? China? <laughs> Willie Burks, his eyes dancing from the last pool on the previous corner, slops in. Nah, ain't nobody here ever been nowhere, not really. You been in China, Buddha? Buddha, suavely pushing twin streams of smoke through his nostrils, nods affirmatively, casually. Mm-hmm, that's where I got my name. It took one look at me and decided my name should be Buddha. After the uh, the deity, you know. <laughs> Naturally, y'all stuck that great law part onto it. Mm -hmm. Who went to cop the vino? Sherman, here he come. Sherman, barely breathing hard, sprints back up the street, clutching a brown paper bag with three bottles of wine in it. Willie Burks, Bobo, and Chico Daddy each snatch a bottle, uncap it, and start passing it around in a loose circle they've eased around Buddha. Where's my change? Buddha asked, noting the cheap brand name going around. I thought you were going to get some good wine. Sherman handing the change over reluctantly. Uh, well, there's five of us. And one bottle of good wine wouldn't go too far anyway. <laughs> what, what's, what, what's good wine? Bobo asked, bringing his bottle up to one side of his mouth. I mean, what do you call good wine, Buddha? <laughs> uh, one good sign is that it costs at least three dollars and something a bottle. <laughs> or maybe it has a good name. For example, Cardon Rue du Splat <laughs> or Beaujolais. The bottle go round and round as Buddha pedantically whips off a series of French-like names. Bobo winking at Chico at it. Uh, what was you starting to say about China, Buddha? China? What about China? I missed that running to get the plug. Buddha was starting to tell us that that's where he got his name. Is that right, Buddha? That's right. What? I mean, why'd you go to China? Mississippi. Hmm. Buddha nut rolls on him as the Afro Lords crack up around him. After the last sneakle, he continues. Actually, it was just a little bit more complicated than that. But to keep it simple, 
even though Mississippi is the very best reason I can think of, let's just say I got on a boat one day and wound up in China. The second floor window, socks open and Josie leans out, mouth curling up viciously. Chester, you gonna stay down there all goddamn night? Buddha, not raising his voice, but lowering it to a bull-like rumble. I'll be down here till I get ready to come upstairs. Josie cocks a long, hard, mean look at him and then abruptly slams the window back down. Buddha, turning back to the group, shakes his head sadly, grandly. Lord, ain't women hard to deal with. Really? Yeah, you can say that again. When you leave out of Buddha, uh, uh, out of China, Buddha? Oh, <laughs> well, that's a little bit less uh, complicated than the way I got in. Actually, in a manner of speaking, I was forced out. What happened was I was living in this palace and shit, doing it to the lady of the house, a young grass widow princess. And the next thing I knew, them crazy ass Chinamen had started to revolutionize and whatnot. So I beat the princess out of 10 pounds of pure jade and split to Europe. Europe? Why Europe? Buddha takes a long reflective look at his interrogator. Well, I'll tell you something. I'd gotten on a boat going anywhere and wound up in China. But when the shit hit the fan in China, I figured, what the hell? I've been overseas for a while. Why not stay? Why not go to Europe? I was hip to the east, you dig. Why not check out the west? One thing I was damn certain about, I sure as hell wasn't going back to Mississippi. <laughs> Sherman pauses in the middle of a swig of juice and sputters it on the people around him. Left. Hey, man, watch shit. So, Europe it was. What was it like? Oh. Well, you young dudes have to keep in mind that the Europe that I knew may not be the Europe of today or the Europe some of you all will know when you get there. What was it like for you, Buddha? Clean out of sight. Clean out of sight. Something else. Like I said, I, I managed to get my black hairs out of China with this jade and all. Think I was home free. But the first thing I know, I'd been rooked out of my jade by some slick talking Armenian cats running the most sophisticated Murphy I'd ever encountered. And instead of landing in Europe, Richard and Carnation Queen, I wound up in Marseille on pure ass, hat in hand, stumbling around looking for a way to get down. Uh, where's Marseille? Chico Daddy asked shyly. <laughs> it's a it's a <laughs> it's a port city in France, little brothers, a port city. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you ever want to go there, don't try it on a Greek freighter like I did. Mm. We must have sailed halfway around the goddamn world, stopping here and there, unloading shit here, dropping shit there, before we finally made it to France. If I hadn't been a young man like you all, I probably would have died from eating all that wormish bread and shit. That's mainly why my stomach is all fucked up today, I think. I was sailing, incidentally, on one of those freighters owned by that old dude uh, who married, uh, what's her name? You mean, yeah, 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 that's the one. <laughs> anyway, by the time we got to Marseille, I'd already decided to cut the freighter loose. If I'd stayed on the bitch too much longer, I'd either have starved to death, caught a red-hot case of the bubonic plague, or been nibbled up to, to, by the rats. Hard to say which. Believe me, it was a truly wretched experience. Buddha pauses to replace his cigarette. Therefore, Lord is pausing in movements with the Bibles. Anyway, I jumped ship five hours after we docked and started looking for a, a way to get down. All right, all right. I'm in the city of Marseille. Fantastic boogie base. Y'all know what boogie base is. Well, don't worry about it. Just think gumbo. 
and big French. <laughs> anyway, after two or three days of hustling and scuffling, doing a little this and a little that, I managed to catch a fantabulous melee bitch named Daisy at a place to hang my hat. The next thing I looked around for was a way to make some grand theft dough. But I'd have to look too, too far for that. Some Algerian cats, there's something like the mafia over there. Them and the Corsicans got in church with me to act as the go-between. My job was to get together with the sailors coming in from the Orient and make deals for the heavy drugs they were smuggling in for the Algerians. It was a course full of all kinds of pitfalls and whatnot, but I stuck, I stuck on for about two months till one day I got greedy. And what kind of bread was you into, Buddha? The great law of Buddha taps ash from the end of his cigarette before going on, uh, I don't know, something like uh, sometimes eight bills a week. That's where the problem exists, you see. I just couldn't see myself making peanuts, running the risk of getting busted and spending 50 long years in the base steel. While those motherfuckers at the top were raking in anywhere from 50 to 100,000 grand a week. I mean, that's how lucrative the enterprise was. First chance I got upon the half pound of uncut heroin, fresh from the laboratory by way of turkey, and split along with my women. Mm. Hmm. By this time, I had collected myself a regular little harem. I had daisies, a melee brawl, a big blonde Alsatian bitch named Yvette, and a little jet black diamond of a sister from Senegal that I call Mademoiselle Diop. <laughs> she was so black that her gums were black. Oh, really? And talk about being fine. Didn't nobody ever have to tell me black was beautiful when I copped her. I could see it with my own eyes. <laughs> Billy Woods, his eyes brightening, asked in a slow, awestruck voice, <clears throat> Boo, how much dope did you say you cut out with? Half a pound. Give or take a few grams. Oh, wow. A full half pound of smack. That's right, little bro. One half pound of pure heroin. With our one in the second floor window, socks open again, and Josie leans far over the ledge. Chester! God damn it, are you gonna bring your ass jive ass up here or not? I'm not going to be yelling out this window all night long. Woman, I told you, I'll be up there when I get up there. Joseph, mumbling a stream of dished up motherfuckers out, slams the window down again, rattling the pane. See there? See there? That goes to substantiate a theory I've had for years. Don't ever get yourself involved with one woman, little brothers. Get three or four, but never one. There really is safety in numbers. Yeah, I can dig where you coming from. Uh, about that dope. How much was it worth? You know, a whole half pound? Buddha, his lip corner pulled down in a hearty fashion. Ah, about half a million, just the way it was. Uncut, you dig? Wow. Wow. Anyway, anyway. I split with my lady. I had to cut Yvette and Mademoiselle Diop loose, excess magic, no pun intended, ha ha. And believe me, that was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. I held on to Daisy because she had some relatives in Paris that I could deal my shit off to. Paris, Paris, s'il vous plaît. Magnifique, ravissant. Hey, give me some of that vodka. <laughs> <laughs> two bottles, three quarters empty, are thrust out to him gallantly. Buddha snatches the nearest one, takes a long swallow. <clears throat> I don't see how y'all can drink this shit. Terrible as it tastes. Mm -hmm. He takes another long professional wine old go and continues his story breathlessly. Mm 
Mm. I dig it. <laughs> Here I am in Paris, a queen of the city. In one hand, I got a half suitcase full of monies. In the other hand, I got a half a pound of uncut horse. And one of the planet's hippest bitches trailing me like a rough stuck puppy dog. I'm really in a bag, you dig? I got to do several things at once. One of the first things I got to do is get rid of all these narcotics because ain't no way I can get it across the border. The next thing I got to do is get me across the border. Because some Algerian cats don't be driving. I know they're going to be on my ass like white on rice soon as they discover that I have confiscated and cut out with all this dope I have. Buddha pauses for a long pull on the wine bottle, absentmindedly sticks another cigarette into his eye beholder. Within a week's time, Daisy had put me on to her cousin's brother or uncle's nephew or somebody, and I had managed to deal off my drugs for 250 million old francs. How much would that be in real money? Buddha casually adjusts the polka dot ascot around his throat before answering, uh, about half a million dollars. <laughs> the Afro Lords lean back on their elbows, astounded by the figure, eyes glazed and shiny from the wine. <laughs> I started to hold out for a million, but I thought, you did, what the hell's the difference really between a half million dollars and a whole million? Especially since I was flirting with instant death, no replay. Every day I was in France, what with the Algerians sniff around for my rectal opening. So I settled for half a million and got on the first thing smoking going to Germany. Sherman, intently following the story, popped in as the question is slowly formed on Chico Daddy's lips. What happened to the melee bro, Buddha? Yeah. What happened to her? Well, I stuck 10 grand to her for mm -hmm. services rendered, mm -hmm. gave her one last hard supersonic fucking, and sent on down the road. Mm -hmm. Had to. It would have been too easy for us to get wrapped up together. Can you see it? A little slant-eyed nigga and a hot yellow Mongolian bitch? Mm -hmm. Can you dig where I'm coming from? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> She hated the power that brought her too. She was really a righteous lady. Mm -hmm. I think she went back to Indochina, what they call Vietnam. No, uh, uh, what's left of it after we split. Buddha pauses for a long swig, looks far into his memory, daydreaming, remember for a few seconds. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Where was I? On the way to Germany. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Germany. Oh, yeah. Deutschland über alles, he says, and sticks his chin out aggressively. I didn't really dig Germany all that much. As you can see, he's interweaving. Yes. What, <laughs> what's happening here? Or what happened there? And, uh, he needs a good outline. <laughs> he had one, but he feels paying attention to it. Okay. <clears throat> I didn't really dig Germany all that much. Thank you for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't really dig Germany all that much. There was a hell of a lot going on there around about this time. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of your mothers and fathers remember the German thing about then. The Nazis would come into power and they were giving the Jew pure ID hell. Mm -hmm. And everybody else they didn't dig. I mean, you would have had to actually be on the scene to believe the trip they were taking the Jews on. It was a lot like what niggas in this country have been going through from day one with a few slight differences. I had a little taste of what was happening in Munich when a mob of young dudes about y'all's age, Hitler youth they call them, chased me down the street throwing lumps of coal at my head. I didn't, <laughs> it didn't take too much of that kind of treatment for we decide I want to be somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I schemed and bribed everybody in sight and got on. Dig it now, little brother, dig it. I didn't really know what was happening in the States, having been away so long, but Europe was in an uproar. Your Hitler thing was going on strong, and I didn't have any part of that. But I didn't want to go back to those Nazis in Mississippi either. Right on, Buddha, right on. Mm -hmm. So... 
With all my money and pretty clothes, I decided to make the Scandinavian scene. Bobo, Chairman, Chico Daddy exchanged puzzled looks and nudged Billy Woods. The who said? Denmark, champ. Denmark, Copenhagen to be exact. Mm -hmm. It was the spring of the year and everything was happening. You see, I can see when I got there why people called it the Italy of the North. I can remember walking through Tivoli Garden, a big old amusement park they had over there, tipping my lid to every fox in the place, and damn near getting ripped off every time I flashed my smile on somebody. <laughs> It was a real groove, but I still felt kind of shaky because I, I knew the Algerians wouldn't be giving up if they had the slightest chance of ripping me off. And they were the kind of dudes who would pinch your nuts off and stuff them in your jibs before you were tortured to death. Several pairs of knees subconsciously draw themselves together slightly. Ooh, wow. Sounds like a cold bloody dude to me. Buddha spilling the corner down his throat from the side of his mouth, pro wine old style. Right on, young blood, right on. But they didn't keep me awake at night. I mean, not really. I had everything I wanted, living like a Viennese pimp in a swank hotel downtown, spending money like it was going out of sight and doing whatever I felt like I was doing. And to top it off, within a week, I had copped an Italian contest who had more bread than I did. Man, them chicks stayed on your case, didn't they? You better believe it. Yeah, you better believe it. Not only that, the broad had old, old money too. You know what I mean? Mm. Or so I thought. When I first cut into the broad at a party on the 15th floor of my hotel, I couldn't believe he was into too much. But there was something about us, some some kind of flavor. The bitch had class. That's what it was, class. That old style class that can't be bought with money. She wasn't outrageously beautiful or anything. She was just fine as a motherfucker. Like an antique chair or something. In addition to that, if that wasn't enough, she had so many names and titles stuck to her ass that it took the cat who introduced us, a lord himself. Uh, five minutes rumbled through him. I can never remember all those names, so right from the beginning, I wound up calling the bitch Susie. <laughs> no, you didn't. The, <laughs> the Afro Lord snicker, give each other fives all around, half drunk on cheap wine. Bam, and baby June trot past like slim dark wolves looking around. Their shoulders apprehensively. Wonder what them fools have stole this time. Mm -hmm. Or on the way to steal. <laughs> ain't, no, ain't no telling, man. Ain't no telling. Chico Daddy shuts to go. Go ahead, Buddha. Go ahead. What happened then? Buddha, his hand a little less steady now, places his empty bottle in the corner of the steps, pulls another cigarette out of a flat box, and lights it without using his holder. <laughs> Within a month after me and the contest, uh, Contessa hooked up, funny how I caught her. One minute, <clears throat> we were in a room, full of room, uh, a room full of people discussing international bullshit in six or seven languages. Next minute, we were off in the study at the library or somewhere standing behind some heavy drapes, and I had shot about three yards of tongue off into her jibs and wobbled four fingers of my left hand up into that royal pussy. Just, <laughs> just what you might call one of those love at first sight things. <laughs> I guess he paused to take a long drag on his cigarette, just to make a long story short. We got off into it. Believe me, little brother, it was heavy, heavy, dip, dripping drama. I bought me and the Contessa matching Ferraris to buzz around in. I knew if push came to share, we could fall back on her dough. 
that we were taking holidays in Greece and swimming around Capri and shit. You know, living that jet set life to the absolute jibs. I found out then how easily a dough can slip through your fingers. I checked my accounts one day and discovered I was down to a couple hundred grand. But it didn't really matter because I knew the contest had dough. So we kept on partying. Every now and then I have a slight chill slip up and down my spinal column. Thinking about the Algerians. Well, I would have fucked the fuck. I was living high off the hall, so it didn't really matter. Nothing mattered but that sweet life. The contestant used to call it La Dolce Vita. La Dolce Vita. Mm -hmm. I think I can give that so-called sweet life and the contestant credit for taking me off into heavy drugs. Uh -oh. We didn't know you was a hype, Buddha. Uh, not now, but I was one for damn near five years. I had gotten onto a fast track with Susie, and one night, probably for lack of anything else to do, we stuck some hypodermic needles into our veins, and next thing I knew, both of us were hooked. Mm -hmm. I'd, hate to, <laughs> I'd hate like hell to try and guess how much of that H I'd sold in gay Paris finally wound up in my own bag. Talk about poetic justice. I tried to kick a whole bunch of times in fancy Swiss sanitariums and whatnot. You know where rich white folks go when they want to try and get their head straightened out. But nothing worked. For one thing, the Contessa was hooked and she didn't give a damn. She actually dug the whole truck. Mm -mm. So like the fucked up weakling I was, every time she shot up, I shot up too. By this time, my money was starting to get funny. I was hooked, and to beat it all, I found that the Contessa was a fucking phony. Mm, mm, mm. No. The bitch was a dago from Arkansas, no. or somewhere like that. Because no. she had been tripping around Europe for years, running one of the grooviest games ever known. And if that wasn't bad enough, me being addicted to her being a phony, I found myself in love with the hoe. In love, little brothers. Can you dig where I'm coming from? Buddha leans closer into Billy Woods' face, gesturing wildly. In fucking love. We had a long way to go before we'd have to start worrying about where the next fix was coming from, you dig? I had enough dough to keep us from becoming a bam and baby June. For a while, anyway, but both of us were going down like the Titanic. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't cut the bitch loose because I was in love with her. Oh, I, I, I got to stop here for a minute because love is a many, many thing. <laughs> the second floor when the socks open again. Josie leans out her hair and rollers, cold cream smeared on her face, drunk. All right! All right! You lying ass son of a bitch! You want to stay down there telling lies and the simple ass pumps for the rest of the night, huh? That's all you want to do! Sit around on your lying ass telling them goddamn fictitious ass stories! Josie clutches sheets of paper in each hand as she screams, the whole effect of her in the window, both comical and tragic. The great Lord Buddha half raises himself from the step, panic on his features. Josie, what the hell you call yourself doing? Josie, and God damn it, if you ain't telling them, you're writing them. Here, why don't you read some of this shit to them? Since they so interested in your every goddamn word, she flings a handful upon a handful of handwritten manuscripts out of the window. Mm -hmm. And why are you reading that shit to them? She follows the papers drifting down in the heavy night air like square flying birds, shirts, suits, mm -hmm. <laughs> hats, mm -hmm. and three or four slow fluttering polka dot ascots. Mm -hmm. Maybe one of them will give you a place to sleep. Cause you sure as hell ain't gonna lay up behind me no more 
with your worthless, jive ass, sorry ass self. Buddha standing straight up now. The panic look replaced by rage shakes his fist at her. Jose, goddamn you, I told you not to cut, touch my stuff. Buddha sprints up the stairs. The Afro Lord, suddenly shocked out of the story, grew, make a half drunken game out of strangling for the loose sheets of paper and decked themselves out in Buddha's clothes. What the hell is it? Dig this, all the pages are numbered. What the hell is it? Man, I'm telling you the truth. You dudes ain't got a bit of cooth. It's a play, Chico Daddy. It's a play. The gang members continue gathering pages and bring them under the light of the street lamp. Here's the title page. The Great Lord Buddha by Chester L. Simmons. I never knew Buddha's whole name. Let's get all the pages together. The unmistakable sound of a pistol shot and then five more in slow succession punches the night. Mm -hmm. The Afro law is frozen in place by the first shot, stand looking sadly up to the second floor window. Buddha's hats and suit coats hanging loosely on their slender frames. The street quiet up till now except for rumbling L trains in the distance and the million miscellaneous sounds of the ghetto hum, thum, throb is suddenly alive. The Lord scrambled to get the rest of the sheets together. Neighbors peek cautiously out of their windows and then, as if by spontaneous combustion, congregate in front of Buddha's building. They buzz around, gossiping already, speculating, making predictions, and stare at the Afro Lords in their haphazard Buddha garments as though they were freaks. The colony's law keepers arrive within minutes, pistols wrong, five carloads full. They make their way arrogant, arrogantly through the group. All right, here, everybody move aside, clear the way here. They cautiously invade the building, come out minutes later with Buddha handcuffed. The Afro Lords wave sheets of paper at him as he's pushed toward a squad car. We got you play, Buddha. Billy Woods shouts out to him. We got you play. The police react as though a new style ride were on the verge of happening with the boys waving sheets of paper at him. The sergeant backs toward his car, frightened but trying not to show it. He shouts, all right now, clear the streets. Excitement's over. Go along now. We won't have any trouble. The people laugh at his fear and stroll away grumbling. The gang shuffles away into the hallway of the building next door. A few minutes later, two ambulance attendants arrive, bring Josie's body out, the cold horse plaid blanket nursed carefully against her curves. After the ambulance leaves, the gang wanders in a daze back over onto the steps. They sit there silently putting Buddha's play together by the numbers and passing it to Billy Woods who reads each page aloud as it is passed to him. That it? That's the last page? That's all we got? Billy Woods nods his head sadly from side to side and announces to the group around him, ain't no ending to it. It ain't got no ending. So there we have the ending of chapter three wow. of what's happening in the ghetto sketches. We will, of course, continue this tomorrow, same time. And this is the with first time we're, we're introduced to Chester L. Simmons. The yes. Uh, let me say a word or two about Chester L. Simmons. Mm -hmm. uh, Chester. I have to say, came to me from a very disastrous experience I had knowing a young brother here in Los Angeles in 1966 who had become addicted to Red Devils, hmm. second all. Hmm. And he sat on the railroad tracks 
right there at, uh, I think, 124th and Athens, where the train used to come through. I don't know if they still have it go through there. Anyway, he was high, and he sat on the tracks, and the train came along and sliced his legs off, just below the knee. And at the time, since he was sedated, he didn't feel very much. So, to memorialize him, I one came over with a character named Chester. Lewis came to me from out of nowhere, and I wanted to have Simmons as like a popular African American name, like Smith, mm -hmm. like Jones, like Washington. Gotcha. So, mm -hmm. Chester L. Simmons. Ah. I might be called an alter ego, but that's neither here nor there, and we'll delve a little bit more into this as time goes on. Thank you for asking the questions, uh, Zola from Zola's Cafe. Yes, as time and, uh, goes on. We get together again. Woo! Thank you. I totally appreciate that. And uh, go find us some good wine. I'm not drinking wine. I'm drinking red coffee with I'm grapes. Drinking, in it. Oh, <laughs> that's like, you don't have grapes. You don't have grapes in spread them. No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Foiled again. <laughs> coffee. Oh God! I just got busted. All right, ghetto sketches could not be purchased because it's out of print. Unless you can find somebody who. You can buy it on Amazon for $75, but we plan to reissue Kettle Sketches next year. Bye, baby. <laughs>